Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Uh, so we move to the second session, which is the final session of this wonderful conference. And uh, the speaker is uh, Gottfried de Kalatai. Um, Gottfried is Professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies at the Oriental Institute of the University of Louvain. He has specialized in the history of Arabic sciences and philosophy and the role played by Islam in the transmission of knowledge from Greek antiquity to the Latin West during the Middle Ages. Amongst other subjects, he has published extensively on the encyclopedic corpus known as Rasail Ikhwana Safa, which is experiencing a renaissance uh, in uh, our time. Um, since 2012, uh, Professor De Kalatai uh, directs Speculum Arabicum, a project on comparative medieval encyclopedism at the University of Louvain. Uh, he will be responded to by Elizabeth Sartell, uh, one of the co-organizers of this uh, conference. Elizabeth is a PhD student in Islamic studies at the University of Chicago Divinity School. Her research focuses on medieval mysticism and the history of science. She is particularly interested in the ways in which mystical texts, mystical texts on cosmology and cosmogony respond to and recode contemporary scientific theories about the universe. So join me in welcoming uh, Professor De Kalatai and, uh, and uh, uh, to this final session. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, thank you also to you, um, Chandra and Elizabeth, for this wonderful uh, conference. I, I don't think it's... So, thank you very much, James, and thank you for, to Chandra and, and, and Elizabeth for organizing this splendid conference and also for having invited me to this wonderful occasion. So, um, I, will, I, I will start by quoting from Episode 3 uh, of the Ikhwan Safa, actually something which was referred to this morning already, and then I will proceed to Episode 36 on cycles and revolutions, which is really uh, central in my uh, presentation. So, at the beginning of Episode 3 on astronomy, the Ikhwan present a subdivision of the science of the stars, Ilm al Nujum, into three great disciplines, which may be translated as follows. One part is the knowledge of the composition of the spheres, of the numbers of stars, of the division of the zodiacal signs, together with the knowledge of their distances, sizes, and movements, and all that follows from this regarding this discipline. This part is called cosmology, ilm al-hayat, literally the science of the exterior shape of the heavens. A second part is the knowledge of how to resolve tables and to make calendars, computations, eras, and the like. A third part is the knowledge of how one draws indications from the things that come to be prior to their coming to be below the sphere of the moon, from the ascendance of the zodiacal signs and the motions of the stars, thanks to the rotation of the sphere. This category is named astrology, ilm arkam al nujum, literally, the science of the celestial decrees. Judging from how ilm al nujum is actually dealt with in the rasail, one infers that it was apparently not the brethren's objective to reflect this particular threefold division in the arrangement of the corpus. Whatever the case, it's important to recall here that the frontiers between the different disciplines making up the signs of the stars, and in particular those between astronomy and astrology, were generally not as precisely delineated in the Middle Ages as they are now. As Julio Samso rightly points out in a general contribution devoted to Islamic astrology, I quote, in spite of the existence of linguistic subtleties which allow us to distinguish in Arabic, for example, between expressions such as ahkam and nujum or tanjim, which clearly denote what we nowadays call, call astrology, and others such as ilm al-falak, astronomy proper, ilm harakat and nujum, 
science with studies the motions of the celestial bodies, and Ilm Hayat al Aflaq, cosmology, it is extremely rare to find a single astronomer of the Islamic period who did not practice at the same time astrology. Zijas, which are astronomical handbooks containing tables enabling the positions of planets and stars to be calculated for a given date and hour, always contain astrological material, and their main application was probably the casting of horoscopes. Treatises on the use of common astronomical instruments, such as the armillary sphere, the astrolabe, and others, often, often contain chapters on their astrological applications." End of quote. What may be safely asserted, on the other hand, is that the brethren were extremely interested in the superior individuals and that they devoted to their study a considerably greater number of pages than those for any other of the sciences of the quadrivium with which the encyclopedia begins. In fact, there are in the corpus no less than three epistles exclusively concerned with heavenly realities, a sum to which one must add countless passages scattered through the rest of the corpus. As might have been expected, Epistle 3, in the group of the mathematical sciences, provides the necessary theoretical framework for the sciences and most of the definitions. Epistle 16, on the heavens and the world, is found in the second section on natural sciences. It overlaps in part with Epistle 3, but generally differs from it by offering a more Aristotelian approach which better frames this second group of sciences. Epistle 16 is also reputed for including an interesting chapter about the distances between the planetary spheres which was investigated at some length by Alessandro Bausani. If the brethren had wished to limit their to a positive description of the universe, it is evident that these two treaties, treatises would have been more than enough. The authors clearly desired, however, to proceed some steps further towards the unknown. Beyond the multiplicity of the elements that constitute the body of the world, they were eager to climb in the same way as Plato had done in the Timaeus, back to the universal soul, which, thanks to the intellect instilled in it, in it by God, makes this great body a moving and living being. In the prologue of Epistle 22, the famous case of the animals versus man before the king of, Jij of the jinn, as in many other places of the encyclopedia, the Ikhwan narrate how the universal soul originally gave rise to a multitude of individual souls, how these later souls descended from the all-encompassing sphere, al-falak al-muhit, in order to spread out up to the center of the earth through all individual bodies of the sublunary world, and finally how these same souls may hope to climb back one day to the external sphere, their ultimate objective announcing the resurrection of all the individual human souls. In astronomical terms, the universal soul moves the external sphere, that is, the whole celestial vault, according to the diurnal revolution from east to west. In turn, in, in turn this ultimate sphere, the primum mobile, carries the revolutions of the eight other spheres, that is, in decreasing order of distance from the all-encompassing sphere, the sphere of the fixed stars, and then the seven planetary spheres, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon. For a terrestrial observer standing at the center of the world, the speeds of revolution of these eight spheres with respect to the external sphere decrease in proportion to the distance from the primum mobile, as, it, as if a certain loss of energy was noticed in each transmission from a sphere to the one below. Ptolemy's Almagest, the principal basis of the Ikhwan's astronomy, reveals that the movement of these spheres are in reality of great complexity. The transmission of this influx from the stars does not stop at this point, as we have seen, but goes as far as the center of the Earth and of the universe. Because their souls originate in the superior realities of the heavens, it naturally follows that the existence of absolutely all beings that come to be under the sphere of the moon is caused by one revolution or another from the heavenly spheres. That is the postulate on which astrology is based from time immemorial, and this is its immediate corollary among the countless cycles that give rhythm to the existence of the sublunary beings, there are some which are short and others which are long. The former correspond to brief astronomical periods and the latter to celestial revolutions of major extent. 
This point is made by the Juan in episode 36, precisely at the moment when they embark on the description of the influence of the heavenly bodies upon the sublunary world. The text reads, Know, my brother, that in this world, every event of rapid development, short-lived, of rapid corruption, and of frequent recommencement result from a motion in a sphere which is rapid, of short period, and of frequent recommencement, whereas every event of slow development, of long duration, of slow decay, originates from a motion which is slow, of long period, and of slow recommencement. An astrological treatise par excellence, the epistle, epistle 36, the epistle on cycles and revolution, is also by nature that which most clearly reveals the inner convictions of the brethren in terms of the powerfulness of astral influences. From the coming to be of worms, insects, and lies, to the emergence of new religions and empires, and from the replacing of men on the royal throne, to the interchange of land masses and seas over the entire surface of the earth, it would seem that nothing in this world of coming to be and passing away escapes the influence of this extreme determinism. Only in the last paragraph of the epistle do the authors attempt to moderate the fatalism of their sayings by bringing man's moral responsibilities and the correlated issue of the retribution of his acts into the discussion. All these things, they write, arise from the command of their creator according to the good and the bad acts of his servants as a retribution for what they have performed. Yet, instead of providing a rational argument to explain how man's free will and the laws of the stars could be adjusted to one another, the brethren, as is usually the case, content themselves with quoting lines from the Quran which only substantiate God's justice vis-à-vis -vis human mankind. This is, I quote, this is for what their hands have earned, that's Quran uh, 4230, and your Lord is not ever unjust to his servants, Quran 4146. Obviously, what the brethren have to say about El Mal Nujum should be assessed against the context, context of the development of these signs in the Mashrik of the 9th and 10th centuries AD. It is commonly accepted by, that by the end of the 8th century, that is when the Abbasid Arun al Rashid occupied the Caliphal throne, Islamic astronomy astrology had already fully assimilated elements originating from the three great cultures of the past the Greek, the Iranian, and the Indian. As Samso, as Samso notes in this article uh, previously quoted, this assimilation was achieved through the contacts established principally in three areas. I quote, Syria, where they, the Arabs, found a Ptolemaic form of astronomy with, with certain Indian influences. Iran, where since the beginning of the Sasanian dynasty, both the al Majest and certain Greek and Indian astrologic astrological texts were known, and India, in which a local astronomical and astrological tradition had been developed based both on Babylonian and pre-Ptolemaic Greek astronomy. In the 9th century, the, the synthesis of such diverse scientific components had found its most authoritative spokesman, spokesman in the person of Abu Mashar al-Balhi, the Abu Mashar of the Latin tradition, and the most famous astrologer of the Middle Ages. Abu Mashar, who appears to have spent most of his long life at the Abbasid court in Baghdad, is the author of two extremely influential introductions to astrology, as it was shown this morning, known respectively as Al-Madkhal al-Kabir al-Ilm al-Ahkam al-Nujum, the great introduction to the science of the Irish astrology, and Al-Madkhal al-Sakhir, the small introduction, as well as various other treatises on more specific parts of the sciences, of this science, such as the discipline known as historical or mundane astrology. From this latter category of writings, whose purpose is to account for the influence of great conjunctions and millennial periods on extended areas of the surface of the earth, large communities of people and events deemed to be particularly significant from a historical point of view, special mention should be made of works like the Kitab and Milal Waldual, the Book of Religions and Dynasties, and above all, the Kitab al-Uluf, 
the book of thousands. According to a well-known formula coined by David Pingree, who masterfully established the addition of this lost treatise by reconstructing its content, its contents from the evidence available in later sources, the Kitab al uluv was nothing but a brazen imposture in which Abu Mashar strove hard to demonstrate that the three great traditions from which astronomers and astrologers of his time had drawn, namely the Indian with the Sinhind, the Iranian with the Zidisha, and the, great, and the Greek with the Almagest, all derived from a unique revelation which would have occurred before the Great Flood and the general conjunction of the planets in Aries in the year 3101 BC. In the introductory part of the Kitab al uluv the great astrologer from Balkh would have his readers believe that he had himself discovered in Isfahan the manuscript of this revelation as it was buried there by the legendary pre-Diluvian king, Dahmuha. In the short version of their last epistle on magic, the Ikhwan Safa borrow a story from Abu Mashar, quoted verbatim from yet another work among his prolific output, namely the Muvakarat, discussion. Albeit in a lesser straightforward manner, Abu Mashar's influence upon them appears to pervade a much larger part of the, of the corpus and is especially noticeable, noticeable in, it would seem, in passages dealing with two notions which play a central role in the Breton theory of conjunctions, both of which are mentioned in great detail in, the, in Epistle 36. The first one is the idea just mentioned above that a conjunction of the seven planets with a starry sphere takes place at the end of gigantic yet cyclical and therefore perfectly predictable periods of time and that this event provokes a flood or a disaster of cataclysmic proportion on the surface of the earth. Regarded as the greatest cycle of the universe, this period was usually named in ancient Greek and Latin sources the great year or the greatest year. In the Latin Middle Ages, it was also called Annus Platonicus, in reference to the fact that Plato had dealt with it in the Timaeus, and that his statement, the first indisputable reference on this subject in literature, never ceased to remain the locus classicus, in spite of not assigning any explicit value to the period. Plato presents the problem as follows. I, uh, sorry, I'm using here uh, Comfort's translation. The month comes to be, uh, to be when the moon completes her own circle and overtakes the sun. The year when the sun has gone round his, his own circle. The periods of the rest have not been observed by men, save for a few, and men have no name for them, nor do they measure one against another by numeric value. They barely know that the wanderings of these others are time at all, bewildering as they are in number and of surprisingly intricate pattern. Nonetheless, it is possible to grasp that the perfect number of time fulfills the perfect year at the moment when the relative speeds of all the eight revolutions have accomplished their courses together and reached their consummation as measured by the circle of the same and uniformly moving. Here, just a brief sketch, just to show that, that, that it's, it's a mathematical uh, computation here at stake, uh, much comparable to the way of finding uh, the time necessary for all the, the hands of the clock to come back into conjunction. But of course, it's much more complicated since there are eight hands <laughs> to take into account. Um, the same doctrine also found its way to India, where ever since an epoch impossible to determine with precision, a general conjunction of the planets, their nodes and apogees, was believed to have taken place at the vernal point, the first degree of the sign of Aries, at the beginning of the universe, and was also believed to recur in the same place at fixed intervals of time, along with a universal flood. Indian astronomers are famous for having devised various systems incorporating essentially the same doctrine and placing the last conjunction and its simultaneous flood at midnight between the 17th and the 18th of February of the year 3101 BC. However, these systems differ from one another by the values each one assigns for the recurrence of the great cycle. So we have here three, uh, sorry, four billions, 320 million years for the Kalpa, 4,320,000 years for the Maha Yuga, 180,000 years for the Yuga. All these systems with appellations Sinhind, Arjabhar, Arkand that betray their Indian origin 
were known to the Muslim astronomers of the 9th and the 10th century, who most probably inherited them from their Sasanian predecessors. Abu Mashar makes extensive use of them in his Kitab al ruf where significantly he refers to the 360,000 year cycle as the cycle of the Persians. From Sasanian astronomy, Muslim scientists also inherited, inherited various other series of shorter world periods, such as that of the Tasirat, in which four cycles are taken into account, small world Tasir, 360 years, middle world Tasir, 3,600 years, big world Tasir, 36,000 years, mighty world Tasir, 360,000 years. It will be observed that these kinds of, se of series frequently overlap with one another. This is the case with the big world Tassir and the mighty world Tassir, whose periods co correspond respectively to the equinoctial precession according to Ptolemy and to the general conjunction of the planets according to the Indians. The brethren's chief reference to the great conjunctional year in Epistle 36 reads as follows. Um, among the conjunctions, no, sorry, among the conjunctions, there is one which takes place once every 360,000 years, namely when all planets gather together in their mean motions on the first minute of the sign of Aries until they come together on it, on it again. And this revolution is called, in the Zija as in hint, one day of the days of the world. Although it is curious to find that the brethren here mention the Sinhin tradition, which is traditionally associated with the four billions 320 million uh, year kalpa rather than with the 180,000 year yuga, the passage tallies very well with what we have just recalled above. At any rate, it makes it very clear that the brethren are fully aware of the Indian provenance of this cycle. What it also makes clear is that, as opposed to other Muslim scientists of their age, and contrary to what some modern scholars have assumed, the Ikhwan never made the confusion between the Ptolemaic Ptolemaic cycle of equinoctial precession and the Platonic conjunctional great year. A detailed discussion of all this with reference to the relevant original sources may be found in my Annus Platonicus, a study entirely devoted to the story of the great year doctrine and its avatars from Plato to the European Renaissance. The other doctrine in the transmission of which Abu Mashar is likely to have played a central role is that of the conjunctions between Saturn and Jupiter which the Ikhwan in the first part of Epistle 36 present in the following terms. Among the, the long period conjunctions, there is the revolution which recommences once every 240 years, namely when Saturn and Jupiter complete 12 conjunctions in one and the same triplicity. There are also conjunctions which, which take place once every 960 years, namely when Saturn and Jupiter complete 48 conjunctions in the four tri triplicities. There are also conjunctions which take place once every 3,840 years, namely when Saturn and Jupiter recommence the conjunctions from the tri triplicities. So here is a brief sketch of the, the theory of triplicities. Uh, this time, it seems that we are dealing with a theory whose origin is authentically Iranian. For reasons that remain unclear, the conjunctions of the two most remote planets were believed by the astrologers of Sasanian Persia to be of particular significance. And this belief was taken up with much enthusiasm by the Muslim followers in the Middle Ages, before being transmitted, always with the same kind of fervor, to the Latin West. Within the realms of Islam, the theory of the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter regularly formed the backbone of works of historical astrology, and this even before Abu Mashar and his aforementioned works. Indeed, one already finds it as such in the treatise on conjunctions, religions, and peoples by Masha'ala, an influential 8th century Persian Jew from Basra, who was appointed by the Caliph al Mansur to cast the horoscope of the foundation of Baghdad on the 30th of July. 762. In the West, the theory was endorsed by Roger Bacon, Pierre Dailly, and was even notoriously taken up by Johannes Kepler in his De Stella Nova, published in 1606. The theory is also at the core of the Ikhwan's astrological doctrine. At the end of Epistle 36, the authors come back to it in more detail by referring, without even bothering to name the two planets, 
to the three great types of influence that these conjunctions are believed to exert upon the world and its inhabitants, namely the religions and empires uh, about which one seeks indications from the great conjunction that take place once every 1,000 years approximately, to the transfer of royalty from one nation to the next, or from one land to the next, or from one family to the next, things that are generated and about whose ex existence one seeks indications from the conjunction that take place once every 240 years, and three, the replacement of individuals on the royal throne and the wars and dissensions that occur as a result of this, things about which one seeks indications from the conjunction that take place once every 20 years. The three periods actually correspond respectively to the great or major, the middle, and the small or short conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn, depending on where in the zodiac these conjunctions occur in relation to the system of the four triplicities. One can hardly overestimate the importance of these types of conjunctions for the brethren, for it is indeed on the basis of these three periods of 20, 240, and 960 years, here rounded to approximately 1,000 years, that our authors elaborated a very peculiar theory designed to account for political and religious changes in this world. In particular, they have sought to combine the theory of the two superior planets, and especially the period corresponding to the recurrences of the, recurrences of the major conjunctions, with a millenarist, millenarist scheme of prophetic hist history whose unorthodoxy may have prompted them to use cryptic forms of expression in certain places. From what can be inferred from their sayings in this and other epistle of the Corpus, the brethren held the view that the history of the world is made of 7,000 year cycles and that the present, cycles, uh, the present cycle is subdivided into seven millennia or thousands, each one of which is heralded by, uh, by, a, distinctive, by a distinctive prophet. Not too surprisingly for Muslim writers who were familiar with pre-Islamic monotheistic view, um, the five prophets retained for the period uh, prior to the present millennium are Adam, Noah, Moses, Abraham, and Jesus. Much more at odds, to be sure, with the conception as professed in mainstream Islam is the fact that the, the present thousand, namely Muhammad's thousand, is here not considered to be the last, but the penultimate. There remains ahead of us, yet, st which within, uh, yet still within the framework of the great prophetic cycle of history, a seventh millennium, who is due to replace the current one, and which is to be revealed to mankind by the Qa'im, literally the one who will rise, the Qa'im of resurrection. A further elaboration of this conception of world history is found in one place of the Rasail, where the Ikhwan provide a most curious adaptation of the story of the sleepers of the cave. Thus, at the end of episode 38, which is entirely dedicated to the issue of rebirth and resurrection, the brethren do not hesitate to identify themselves with the seven sleepers of the Quranic version of this, of this fable, and they strive hard to make the whole story fit with their millenarian preoccupations. If need be, the elements from the above discussion would suffice to confirm that the Ikhwan's obsession with astrology is not just the mark of a whimsical temperament on their part, but on the contrary, the necessary cor corollary of their intellectual system as a whole, and that it is therefore the modern scholar's duty to investigate it on the basis of this assumption. A considerable part of recent scholarship on the brethren has been spent demonstrating that they deserve to be counted among amongst the Neoplatonist philosophers of Islam, on the one hand, and on the other hand, that the esoteric part of their doctrine has much in common with that of the Ismaili thinkers of their time. In spite of the many discrepancies which can be found in their encyclopedia, the worldview put forward through the whole corpus is fundamentally and essentially coherent. It is grounded on certain suppositions which the brethren have indeed derived from their Neoplatonist predecessors, such as the emanationist scheme and the network of analogies and correspondences between the macrocosm and the microcosm, together with the large spectrum of influences exerted by the beings of the heavenly spheres upon the world of the coming to be and passing away. As has been established by various scholars in recent times, in particular Yves Marquet throughout his vast bulk of Ikhwanian studies, the Brethren doctrinal system should also be regarded as a direct and very natural cons consequence of their Ismaili-like attitude vis-à-vis -vis the present state of affairs of this world. 
convinced as they were of the necessity to live and to write under concealment in order to preserve the genuine revelation of God and the true wisdom of past masters, what these propagandists on the fringe of Orthodox Islam could communicate to their partisans was either their own amb ambition to provoke a religious or political upheaval or else their hopes that one day new circumstances would allow the current tyranny to be replaced by the realm of the pure. The image of the sleepers of the cave and the innumerable metaphors of the same kind which the Ikhwan make use of when dealing with their own mission are, in my view, a clear indication that they never seriously considered the former option. Naturally, in the case that the latter option was the only one remaining, astrology had much to commend it. In all, the Rasail includes a great quantity of passages in which the brethren are concerned with the periodical transfer of human societies on the surface, on the surface of the earth. And this is obviously to be linked with their interest in messianism, in messianism. A telling example of this is found at the end of the epistle on geography. There, after the larger part of the treatise um, had been con has been concerned with the necessary definitions as well as with the presentation of the Eucumene and its subdivisions along the lines of the Greek theory of the seven climes, the brethren conclude the epistle with two sections devoted to, the, to the doctrine of the periodical transfer of, na of nations and religions on the surface of the earth and the idea that the dominion of the people of good, Dawlat al-Khair, is to replace the dominion of the people of evil, Dawud al-Shaq. The central message with which the Ikhwan uh, address the readers in that part of the treatise is their conviction that this replacement will take place, I quote, when the sages, the philosophers, the best of men, the nobles, all share a unique view, profess a unique doctrine and a unique religion, when they are all bound to one another by a unique pledge and a unique covenant, namely that they shall never quarrel among themselves nor abstain from assisting each other in such a way as to become like a unique man in all of their affairs and like a unique soul in all of the measures they take when they aim at seeking assistance from religion and from the quest for the hereafter. A passage such as this one is most revealing of the brethren's attitude. That it was written with the purpose of contributing to the author's own propaganda is not in doubt. The, con the, conver the convergence of views among scholars, the merging of faith among believers, the mutual assistance between the people of this world, all this is indeed in perfect keeping with what the Ikhwan say of their own aspiration, aspirations and objectives all throughout the Rasail. At the same time, however, one cannot help being struck by the fact that the brethren do not refer to the passage from one dominion to the other in any other way than by the expression of, a wishful, of wishful thinking. In fact, they seem to adopt an idealistic approach, which is exactly the opposite of that taken by whoever is, is minded to lead a political revolution. As was mentioned above, the Ikhwan make the slow movement of equinoctial precession responsible for the overall transfer of civilization from one quarter to the earth surf of the Earth's surface to the next. Yet, as soon as it comes to dealing with more local changes, such as those affecting one particular nation or empire uh, of the Yukumene, the discussion tends quite naturally to mention one of the three kinds of Saturn-Jupiter conjunctions although the reference in the text is not always as explicit as modern investigators would wish. This is notoriously, notoriously the case with the prediction which the Ikhwan make to their partisans at the beginning of their highly propagandistic treatise on the modalities of the call to go to God, that is Epistle 48. The passage may be translated as follows. Among the features of, of our brethren is that they are learned in the field of religion, that they know the secrets of prophecies and that they, are, that they are well trained in the philosophical disciplines. When you meet one of them and seem to note integrity in him, tell him something that will please him and remind him of the recommencement of the revolution of revealing and awakening, as well as of the dissipation of worries for mankind due to the transfer of the conjunction from the sign of fiery tripli triplicities to the sign of vegetal and animal triplicities in the tenth circle, which corresponds to the house of power and the appearance of the eminent people. 
The passage has been discussed by various modern scholars, including the present, uh, the present uh, writer, uh, with the purpose of dating the transfer of the conjunction referred to uh, by the Ikhwan, and consequently, but this is perhaps another form of wishful thinking, to take it as a possible indication of the time the authors of the corpus lived and worked. The discussion involves too many technical details to be reported here again with profit. Besides, it would, be, it would also be fair to admit that the Ikhwan's formulation in this and other texts of this kind remains too elliptic to allow one to arrive at absolutely secure conclusions. In spite of a clear divergence among scholars as to the date of the phenomenon announced by the brethren, what nevertheless remains indisputed is that the authors of the Rasa'il are here alluding to a Saturn-Jupiter conjunction of the longest type, and this fact alone confirms with evidence the unparalleled role with the Ikhwan, which the Ikhwan have assigned to these conjunctions in their conception of world history. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to um, thank you for sharing this intriguing paper with us. Your paper asks an important question that in many ways pushes us beyond what we've already focused on at this conference. So instead of looking mainly at how the Ikhwan Asafa have characterized astrology and where it fits into their larger philosophy, you push us to consider why they have characterized astrology in this particular way and why, is it, why it is accorded such a prominent place in their Rasa'il. One of the strongest parts of the paper was the link you established between the Ikhwan Asafa and the contemporary discourse within which their Rasa'il emerged. Your positioning of these epistles within this larger framework helped highlight the parts of the astrological theories within the Rasa'il which were unique. The influence of Abu Masha's theories of conjunctions is explicitly laid out in your paper, which then effectively underscores the main focus of the paper. What is the unique function of these conjunctions for the brethren? I appreciated your analysis of how the brethren incorporate these astrological theories, but reappropriate them or recode them in new ways, leading to the ultimate question, as your title alludes to, of why these theories are specifically recoded, so that they can tell a new kind of story or support a new kind of philosophical or esoteric theory. This overarching concern of the paper um, led me to many, many questions, um, which I will narrow down to only three of the most pertinent, as I'm sure many others here also want to ask you questions and engage with both you and Robert Morrison in a conversation about your presentations. Um, so first, you begin your paper with the threefold classification of the science of the stars, which includes first, cosmology, second, calendars and computations, uh, which seems to be a kind of intermediary link between astronomy and astrology, um, and third, astrology. And although you know that there are some subtle linguistic differences uh, which can help the modern scholar distinguish how the medieval writers differentiated the different disciplines involved, you also write that it is not the brethren's objective to reflect this particular threefold division in their epistles. Um, however, your paper begins with this threefold division, as does the brethren's third epistle, which I believe is the first to focus on the science of the stars, um, which leads to the question, what purpose does this classification serve? Why should we start here? And why do we talk about the science of the stars, astrology, astronomy, cosmology, under both the mathematical and the natural sciences, epistles 3 and 16, which in a sense seems to classify them under both categories? So what is at stake in making these kinds of classifications if it's not to set up the brethren's later positioning of astrology as an integral part of their philosophical and esoteric messianism? Uh, secondly, you focus on two different theories of conjunctions from Abu Mashar that deeply influence the brethren's writings, both on the great conjunctions of all seven planets, or the great year, and the various conjunctions of Saturn and Jupiter. The latter of these conjunctions is recoded in a remarkable way as the longer conjunctions of Saturn and Jupiter, which take place approximately every thousand years, become the mark of the cycles of religions and prophets, the last of which then is integral in the <coughs> brethren's messianism as they expect the next major conjunction to mark a new era of the realm of the pure, heralded by the Ka'im, which comes after the present era under the prophet Muhammad. I was wondering, however, about the relationship between these two different theories of conjunctions that you mention. 
So does the great year also play into the Brethren's theories on the nature of the present universe and future messianic hope for the new era? Or are these seen as separate conjunctions, heralding completely different implications for the Brethren's overarching philosophy? Finally, I was curious about the place of human agency in the Brethren's astrological messianic thought. So you write that the Brethren, um, and here I'm quoting, adopt an idealistic approach which is exactly the opposite of that taken by whoever is minded to lead a political revolution, end quote. Instead, talking about the future era with only expressions of wishful thinking. And I wonder if I can ask you to say a bit more about this conclusion. So earlier in the paper, you write that the brethren acknowledge a tension between human agency and fatalism towards the end of Epistle 36, but they don't provide a satisfactory answer to this question. Then in your conclusion, the brethren are instructed to remind one another of the recommencement of the revolution of revealing and awakening due to this conjunction. A specific kind of action, though certainly not one of overt political revolution. So I'm curious whether this reminding is tied to the recurring command to know my brother. So what is this importance of knowing and remembering? And what does it relate, and does it relate to a specific action stemming from knowledge? If one knows astrological conjunctions, can one direct the powerfulness of astral influences, or is one only more complete in knowing the nature of the universe? So with this in mind, returning back to your conclusion, it seems that the brethren write about this change into the realm of the pure in terms that explicitly match their own aspirations and objectives in creating a space with a shared unique doctrine, a unique religion, and unique covenant of assisting one another. So are the Ikhwan referring only to the hope of a future era and calling upon or calling one another to a specific type of esoteric action that involves the awakening of their brethren to this revelation of the truth that they hold. So can astrology not only help to hope for and possibly predict this messianic change in era, but also help to affect it? So is this state of shared views and faith, uh, which the brethren seem to aim towards in both their messianic hopes and their own objectives, a state that can be created and cultivated? And so thank you once again for this delightfully intriguing paper that raised so many questions, uh, not only about the place of astrology, but also its function. So, and I look forward to hearing any additional insights you can give me on the Aristotle. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for these questions. Um, they are very good points. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is to answer the questions. <laughs> so I will try to start with the, the first one about the, the classification or the, the, the subdivision of the signs of the stars into three. It's true, you're right. Um, the brethren seemed here, and that's epistle three, to have a kind of program, and then we never find the, pro the, the, the answer or the, or the, 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 or the execution of the, of the program through, through the Rasail. Um, so it, it looks like a bit incoherent, but my, my, my view here would, would be to say that co incoherence of this type, there are many of them in, in, through the Rasail. Um, and I think it's, it's very important to, to insist on the fact that um, it, it, it becomes increasingly clear that the composition, the compilation um, of the corpus um, extended over various generations. Um, that it's really kind of stratified compilation. Um, very much, I think, in, 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 in the same way as, as the Jabirin corpus, for example. So we have to deal with the Ikhwanian corpus a bit like the, the Jabirin corpus. And we also have to pay attention on to, not, not, to, not to forget that there is a, an enormous gap between the supposed time of compilation and the first, the first manuscripts we have. And many things may have happened uh, during the interval. And this may explain many of the uh, incoherences or apparent, apparent incoherences in, 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 in the work. But I, I remain convinced that it is, uh, by and large, a very coherent work. And I think there is, it, it, makes, it makes sense to have a first uh, mention, a first epistle on astronomy in the first part. Uh, it's very, uh, it, it's part of the quadrivium. And the brethren are 
as uh, Matt uh, mentioned the other day, are followers of, of Pythagoras. So it's, it's really Pythagorean here. And then it, it makes sense to have an epistle dedicated to the, 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 the same science, but from an, a, a, another approach in the second part uh, on natural sciences. And this is more Aristotelian, or Ptolemy, but it's, it's more Aristotelian. And then, as I tried to explain, it also makes, makes sense for people who believed much in astrology uh, to have another mention of astrology or the science of the stars in the third part about the science of the soul and, and the intellect. And this is where Neoplatonism come, comes in. So I think this is rather uh, coherent. Um, so the second, the second point was about the different cycles. It's true that there are many cycles mentioned <laughs> in, through the Rasa'il. I have mentioned some of them. So the great year, the equinoctial precession, Saturn-Jupiter conjunctions, and that kind of things. There are many more. Uh, there, are also, there is also a, an interesting cycle of 50,000 years. Um, and actually, I think it, was, it's not, it has not even been published, but uh, Eud Krines um, has written a, a, a wonderful article, a wonderful study about this cycle in the Rasa'il and in the Risala uh, Jamia, with very suggestive uh, in parallels, interesting parallels with, with, with the Jewish tradition. Uh, and, and it has something, well, it has all to do with, with uh, numerology, seven, seven times seven, 49, 49, 50, well, that's that sort of thing. And so w w what I think is that the brethren inherited uh, in many different doctrines from many different origins. And it's an encyclopedia. It's, 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 a, it's a huge stuff, it's huge material. And so it's quite difficult to reconcile all the elements. So it's a bit frustrating, but I, I, I haven't been able to, to see quite clearly how they managed to uh, make all, the, all these elements coincide. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe for the future, I don't know. <laughs> and, and your last point is about, uh, yes, astrology. Is it, is it um, just hope? Or maybe there can be some action to be taken. Um, but I really, I really consider that I, I, I really can't imagine um, the Ikhwana Safa as political activists. Really. So that, everything you read in the Rasa'il uh, shows much more the contrary. They're, they were much too, too ironic or too, too pacifist. I don't know, the metaphors like the sleepers, the sleepers of the cave, uh, this is not to be expected from people uh, having in mind to lead a, a political revolution, I, I, I think. Maybe, maybe uh, so astrology is just hope in their view. What, what they say is, uh, see, my friend, someday things will turn better because of the conjunctions, and that's it. And we just have to hope for this. <laughs> um, there is a bit more about what, what, what you say, probably in, in the last epistle on, 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 on magic, because a good deal of it is devoted to astral magic. And it's true that in, in this sense, people are able to take action. Uh, but otherwise, but, but the, the problem here is, is, is to see, is to, 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 to see whether, whether the Ikhwan were the genuine authors of that epistle. That's another problem. So. I hope I have uh, managed to answer some of your questions. <laughs> <laughs>